Chapter Thirteen of Dracula. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula, by Bram Stoker. Chapter Thirteen. Read by Dennis Sayers, Elizabeth Clett, David Lawrence. Doctor Seward's diary continued. The funeral was arranged for the next succeeding day, so that Lucy and her mother might be buried together. I attended to all the ghastly formalities, and the urbane undertaker proved that his staff was afflicted or blessed with something of his own obsequious suavity. Even the woman who performed the last offices for the dead remarked to me in a confidential, brother professional way, when she had come out from the death chamber, She makes a very beautiful corpse, sir. It's quite a privilege to attend on her. It's not too much to say that she will do credit to our establishment. I noticed that Van Hilsing never kept far away. This was possible from the disordered state of things in the household. There were no relatives at hand, and as Arthur had to be back the next day to attend at his father's funeral, we were unable to notify anyone who should have been bidden. Under the circumstances, Van Helsing and I took it upon ourselves to examine papers, etc. He insisted upon looking over Lucy's papers himself. I asked him why, for I feared that he, being a foreigner, might not be quite aware of English legal requirements, and so might, in ignorance, make some unnecessary trouble. He answered me, I know, I know, you forget that I am a lawyer as well as a doctor, but this is not altogether for the law. You knew that when you avoided the coroner. I have more than him to avoid. There may be papers more such as this. As he spoke, he took from his pocket the memorandum which had been in Lucy's breast and which she had torn in her sleep. When you find anything of the solicitor, who is for the late Mrs. Westenra, seal all her papers, and write him tonight. For me, I watch here in the room, and in Miss Lucy's old room all night, and I myself search for what may be. It is not well that her very thoughts go into the hands of strangers. I went on with my part of the work, and in another half hour had found the name and address of Mrs. Westenda's solicitor, and had written to him. All the poor lady's papers were in order. Explicit directions regarding the place of burial were given. I had hardly sealed the letter when, to my surprise, Van Helsing walked into the room, saying, Can I help you, friend John? I am free, and... If I may, my service is to you. Have you got what you looked for? I asked. To which he replied, I did not look for any specific thing. I only hoped to find, and find I have, all that there was. Only some letters and a few memoranda, and a diary new begun. But I have them here, and we shall for the present say nothing. I shall see that poor lad tomorrow evening, and with his sanction I shall use some. When we had finished the work in hand, he said to me, And now, friend John, I think we may to bed. We want some sleep, both you and I, and rest to recuperate. Tomorrow we shall have much to do, but for the tonight there is no need of us, alas. Before turning in, we went to look at poor Lucy. 
the undertaker had certainly done his work well, for the room was turned into a small chapelle ardent. There was a wilderness of beautiful white flowers, and death was made as little repulsive as might be. The end of the winding sheet was laid over the face. When the professor bent over and turned it gently back, we both started at the beauty before us, the tall wax candles showing a sufficient light to note it well. All Lucy's loveliness had come back to her in death, and the hours that had passed, instead of leaving traces of decays of facing fingers, had but restored the beauty of life, till positively I could not believe my eyes that I was looking at a corpse. The professor looked sternly grey. He had not loved her as I had, and there was no need for tears in his eyes. He said to me, Remain till I return, and left the room. He came back with a handful of wild garlic from the box waiting in the hall, but which had not been opened, and placed the flowers amongst the others, on and around the bed. Then he took from his neck, inside his collar, a little gold crucifix, and placed it over the mouth. He restored the sheet to its place, and we came away. I was undressing in my own room, when, with the premonitory tap of the door, he entered and at once began to speak. Tomorrow I want you to bring me before night a set of post-mortem knives. Must we make an autopsy? I asked. Yes and no. I want to operate, but not what you think. Let me tell you now, but not a word to another. I want to cut off her head and take out her heart. Ha! You as a surgeon, and so shocked. You whom I have seen with no tremble of hand or heart do operations of life and death that make the rest shudder. Oh, but I must not forget, my dear John, that you loved her, and I have not forgotten it, for it is I that shall operate and you must not help. I would like to do it tonight, but for Arthur, I must not. He will be free after his father's funeral tomorrow, and he will want to see her, to see it. Then, when she is coffined, ready for the next day, you and I shall come when all sleep. We shall unscrew the coffin lid, and shall do our operation place all, so that none know, save we alone. But why do it at all? The girl is dead. Why mutilate her poor body without need? And if there is no necessity for a post-mortem, and nothing to gain by it, no good to her, to us, to science, to human knowledge, why do it? Without such, it is monstrous. For answer, he put his hand on my shoulder, and said with infinite tenderness, Friend John, I pity your poor bleeding heart, and I love you the more because it does so bleed. If I could, I would take on myself the burden that you do bear. But these are things that you know not but that you shall know, and bless me for knowing, though they are not pleasant things. John, my child, you have been my friend now for many years, and yet did you ever know me to do any without good cause? I may err, I am a man, but I believe in all I do. Was it not for these causes that you sent for me, when the great trouble came. Yes, were you not amazed, nay, 
horrified when I would not let Arthur kiss his love, though she was dying, and snatched him away by all my strength. Yes, and yet you saw how she thanked me with her so beautiful dying eyes, her voice too so weak, and she kissed my rough old hand and blessed me. you not hear me swear promise to her, that so she closed her eyes, grateful. Yes. Well, I have good reason now for all I want to do. You have for many years trust me. You have believed me weeks past, when there be things so strange that you might have well doubt. Believe me yet a little, friend God. If you trust me not, then I must tell what I think, and that is not perhaps well. And if I work as work I shall, no matter trust or no trust, without my friend trust in me, I work with heavy heart, and feel oh so lonely when I want all help and courage that may be. I paused a moment and went on solemnly. Friend John, there are strange and terrible days before us. Let us not be two, but one, that so we work to a good end. Will you not have faith in me? I took his hand and promised him. I held my door open as he went away, and watched him go to his room and close the door. As I stood without moving, I saw one of the maids pass silently along the passage. She had her back to me, so did not see me, and go into the room where Lucy lay. The sight touched me. Devotion is so rare, and we are so grateful to those who show it unasked to those we love. Here was a poor girl putting aside the terrors which she naturally had of death, to go watch alone by the bier of the mistress whom she loved, so that the poor clay might not be lonely till laid to eternal rest. I must have slept long and soundly, for it was broad daylight when Van Helsing waked me by coming into my room. He came over to my bedside and said, need not trouble about the knives. We shall not do it. Why not? I asked, for his solemnity of the night before had greatly impressed me. Because, said Stern, it is too late, or too early. See? Here he held up the little golden crucifix. This was stolen in the night. How stolen? I asked in wonder, since you have it now. Because I get it back from the worthless wretch who stole it, from the woman who robbed the dead and the living. Her punishment will surely come, but not through me. She knew not altogether what she did, and thus, unknowing, she only stole. Now we must wait. He went away on the word, leaving me with a new mystery to think of, puzzle to grapple with. The forenoon was a dreary time, but at noon the solicitor came. Mr. Marquand of Holman Sons Marquand and Litterdale. He was very genial and very appreciative of what we had done and took off our hands all cares as to details. During lunch he told us that Mrs. Westenra had for some time expected sudden death from her heart, and had put her affairs in absolute order. He informed us that, with the exception of a certain entailed property of Lucy's father, which now, in default of direct issue, went back to a distant branch of the family, the whole estate, real and personal, was left 
absolutely to Arthur Holmwood. When he had told us so much, he went on, Frankly, we did our best to prevent such a testamentary disposition, and pointed out certain contingencies that might leave her daughter either penniless or not so free as she should be to act regarding a matrimonial alliance. Indeed, we pressed the matter so far that we almost came into collision, for she asked us if we were or were not prepared to carry out her wishes. Of course, we had then no alternative but to accept. We were right, in principle, and ninety-nine times out of a hundred we should have proved, by the logic of events, the accuracy of our judgment. Frankly, however, I must admit that in this case any other form of disposition would have rendered impossible the carrying out of her wishes, for by her predeceasing her daughter the latter would have come into possession of the property, and even had she only survived her mother by five minutes, her property would, in case there were no will, and the will was a practical possibility in such a case, have been treated at her decease as her intestacy, in which case Lord Galdami, though so dear a friend, would have had no claim in the world, and the inheritors, being remote, would not be likely to abandon their just rights, for sentimental reasons, regarding an entire stranger. I assure you, my dear sirs, I am rejoiced at the result, perfectly rejoiced. He was a good fellow, but his rejoicing at one little part in which he was officially interested of so great a tragedy was an object lesson in the limitations of sympathetic understanding. He did not remain long, but said he would look in later in the day and see Lord Galdeming. His coming, however, had been a certain comfort to us, since it assured us that we should not have to dread hostile criticism as to any of our acts. Arthur was expected at five o'clock, so a little before that time we visited the death chamber. It was so in very truth, for now both mother and daughter lay in it. The undertaker, true to his craft, had made the best display he could of his works, and there was a mortuary air about the place that lowered our spirits at once. Van Helsing ordered the former arrangement to be adhered to, explaining that, as Lord Galdamin was coming very soon, it would be less harrowing to his feelings to see all that was left of his fiancée, quite alone. The undertaker seemed shocked at his own stupidity, and exerted himself to restore things to the condition in which we left them the night before so that when Arthur came, such shocks to his feeling as we could avoid were saved. Poor fellow. He looked desperately sad and broken. Even his stalwart manhood seemed to have shrunk somewhat under the strain of his much-tried emotions. He had, I knew, been very genuinely and devotedly attached to his father, and to lose him and at such a time was a bitter blow to him. With me he was warm as ever, and to Van Helsing he was sweetly courteous, but I could not help seeing that there was some constraint with him. The professor noticed it too, and motioned me to bring him upstairs. I did so, and left him at the door of the room, as I felt he would like to be quite alone with her. But he took my arm and led me in, saying huskily, You loved her too, old fellow. She told me all about it, and there was no friend had a closer place in her heart than you. I don't know how to thank you for all you have done for her. I can't.
can't think yet. Here he suddenly broke down, and threw his arms round my shoulders, and laid his head on my breast, crying, Oh, Jack, Jack, what shall I do? The whole of life seems gone from me all at once. There is nothing in the wide world for me to live for. I comforted him as well as I could. In such cases, men do not need much expression. A grip of the hand, the tightening of an arm or the shoulder, a sob in unison, are expressions of sympathy dear to a man's heart. I stood still and silent till his sobs died away, and then I said softly to him, Come and look at her. Together we moved over to the bed, and I lifted the lawn from her face. God, how beautiful she was! Every hour seemed to be enhancing her loveliness. It frightened and amazed me somewhat. And as for Arthur, he fell to trembling, and finally was shaken with doubt, as with an ague. At last, after a long pause, he said to me in a faint whisper, Jack, is she really dead? I assured him sadly that it was so, and went on to suggest, for I felt that such a horrible doubt should not have life for a moment longer than I could help it, that it often happened that after death faces become softened and even resolved into their youthful beauty, that this was especially so when death had been preceded by any acute or prolonged suffering. I seemed to quite do away with any doubt, and after kneeling beside the couch for a while, and looking at her lovingly and long, he turned aside. I told him that that must be goodbye, as the coffin had to be prepared. So he went back and took her dead hand in his, and kissed it, and bent over and kissed her forehead. He came away fondly looking back over his shoulder at her as he came. I left him in the drawing room and told Van Helsing that he had said goodbye. So the latter went to the kitchen to tell the undertaker's men to proceed with the preparations and to screw up the coffin. When we came out of the room again, I told him of Arthur's question, and he replied, I am not surprised. Just now, I doubted for a moment myself. We all dined together, and I could see that poor Art was trying to make the best of things. Van Helsing had been silent all dinner time, but when we had lit our cigars, he said, Lord, but Arthur interrupted him. No, no, not that, for God's sake, not yet at any rate. Forgive me, sir. I did not mean to speak offensively. It is only because my loss is so recent. The professor answered very sweetly. I only used that name because I was in doubt. I must not call you Mr. And I have grown to love you, yes, my dear boy, to love you as Arthur. Arthur held out his hand and took the old man's warmly. Call me what you will, he said. I hope I may always have the title of a friend. And let me say that I am at a loss for words to thank you for your goodness to my poor dear. He paused a moment and went on. I know that she understood your goodness even better than I do. And if I was rude or in any way wanting at that time you acted so. You remember. The professor nodded. You must forgive me. He answered with a grave kindness. I know it was hard for me to quite press me then, for to trust such violence he needs to understand, and 
I take it that you do not, that you cannot trust me now, for you do not yet understand. And there may be more times when I shall want you to trust when you cannot, and may not, and must not yet understand. But the time will come when your trust shall be whole and complete in me, and when you shall understand as though the sunlight himself shone through. Then you shall bless me from first to last, for your own sake, and for the sake of others, and for her dear sake, to whom I swore to protect. And indeed, indeed, sir, said Arthur warmly, I shall in all ways trust you. I know and believe you have a very noble heart, and you are Jack's friend, and you were hers, you shall do what you like. The professor cleared his throat a couple of times, as though about to speak, and finally said, May I ask you something now? Certainly. You know that Mrs. Westenra left you all her property? No, poor dear. I never thought of it. And as it is all yours, have a right to deal with it as you will. I want you to give me permission to read all Miss Lucy's papers and letters. Believe me, it is no idle curiosity. I have a motive of which, to be sure, she would have approved. I have them all here. I took them before we knew that all was yours, so that no strange hand might touch them. No strange eye look through words to her soul. I shall keep them, if I may. Even you may not see them yet, but I shall keep them safe. No word shall be lost, and in good time I shall give them back to you. It is a hard thing, then I ask. But you will do it, will you not, for Lucy's sake? Arthur spoke out heartily, like his old self. Dr. Van Helsing, you may do what you will. I feel that in saying this I am doing what my dear one would have approved. I shall not trouble you with questions till the time comes. The old professor stood up, as he said solemnly, And you are right. There will be pain for us all. But it will not be all pain, nor will this pain be the last. We, and you too, you most of all, dear boy, will have to pass through the bitter water before we reach the sweet. But we must be brave of heart, and unselfish, and do our duty, and all will be well. I slept on a sofa in Arthur's room that night. Van Helsing did not go to bed at all. He went to and fro, as if patrolling the house, and was never out of sight of the room where Lucy lay in her coffin, strewn with the wild garlic flowers, which sent through the odor of lily and rose a heavy, overpowering smell into the night. Mina Harker's Journal 22 September In the train to Exeter, Jonathan sleeping. It seems only yesterday that the last entry was made, and yet how much between then, in Whitby and all the world before me, Jonathan away and no news of him, and now, married to Jonathan, Jonathan a solicitor, a partner, rich, master of his business, Mr. Hawkins dead and buried and Jonathan with another attack that may harm him. Some day he may ask me about it. Down it all goes. I am rusty in my shorthand. See what unexpected prosperity does for us. So it may be as well to freshen it up again with an exercise, anyhow. The service was very simple and very solemn. There were only ourselves and the servants there, one or two old friends of his from Exeter, his London agent, and a gentleman representing Sir John Paxton, 
the president of the Incorporated Law Society. Jonathan and I stood hand in hand, and we felt that our best and dearest friend was gone from us. We came back to town quietly, taking a bus to Hyde Park Corner. Jonathan thought it would interest me to go to the row for a while, so we sat down. But there were very few people there, and it was sad-looking and desolate to see so many empty chairs. It made us think of the empty chair at home. So we got up and walked down Piccadilly. Jonathan was holding me by the arm, the way he used to in the old days before I went to school. I felt it very improper, for you can't go on for some years teaching etiquette and decorum to other girls without the pedantry of it biting into yourself a bit. But it was Jonathan, and he was my husband, and we didn't know anybody who saw us, and we didn't care if they did. So on we walked. I was looking at a very beautiful girl, in a big cartwheel hat, sitting in a Victoria outside Giuliano's, when I felt Jonathan clutch my arm so tight that he hurt me, and he said under his breath, My God! I am always anxious about Jonathan, for I fear that some nervous fit may upset him again. So I turned to him quickly and asked him what it was that disturbed him. He was very pale, and his eyes seemed bulging out, as half in terror and half in amazement, he gazed at a tall thin man with a beaky nose and black moustache and pointed beard, who was also observing the pretty girl. He was looking at her so hard that he did not see either of us, and so I had a good view of him. His face was not a good face. It was hard, and cruel, and sensual, and big white teeth that looked all the whiter because his lips were so red, were pointed like an animal's. Jonathan kept staring at him, till I was afraid he would notice. I feared he might take it ill, he looked so fierce and nasty. I asked Jonathan why he was disturbed, and he answered, evidently thinking that I knew as much about it as he did, "'Do you see who it is?' "'No, dear,' I said, "'I don't know him. Who is it?' His answer seemed to shock and thrill me, for it was said as if he did not know that it was me, Mina, to whom he was speaking. It is the man himself." The poor dear was evidently terrified at something, very greatly terrified. I do believe that if he had not had me to lean on and to support him, he would have sunk down. He kept staring. A man came out of the shop with a small parcel, and gave it to the lady, who then drove off. The dark man kept his eyes fixed on her, and when the carriage moved up Piccadilly, he followed in the same direction, and hailed a hansom. Jonathan kept looking after him, and said, as if to himself, "'I believe it is the Count, but he has grown young. My God, if this be so! Oh, my God, my God, if I only knew, if only I knew!' He was distressing himself so much that I feared to keep his mind on the subject by asking him many questions, so I remained silent. I drew away quietly, and he, holding my arm, came easily. We walked a little further, and then went in and sat for a while in the green park. It was a hot day for autumn, and there was a comfortable seat in a shady place. After a few minutes staring at nothing, Jonathan's eyes closed, and he went quickly into a sleep with his head on my shoulder. I thought it was the best thing for him, so did not disturb him. In about twenty minutes he woke up and said to me quite cheerfully, "'Why, Mina, have you been asleep? Oh, do forgive me for being so rude. Come, and we'll have a cup of tea somewhere.' He had evidently forgotten all about the dark stranger as, in his illness, he had forgotten all that this episode had reminded him of. I don't like this lapsing into forgetfulness. It may make or continue some injury to the brain. I must not ask him, for fear I shall do more harm than good. But I must somehow learn the facts of his journey abroad. The time has come, I fear, when I must open the parcel, and know what is written. Oh, Jonathan, you will, I know, forgive me if I do wrong, but it is for your own dear sake. Later. A sad homecoming in every way. The house empty of the dear soul who was so good to us. Jonathan still pale and dizzy under a slight relapse of his malady. And now a telegram from Van Helsing, whoever he may be. You will be grieved to hear that Mrs. Westenra died five days ago, and that Lucy died the day before yesterday. They were both buried to-day. Oh, what a wealth of sorrow in a few words! Poor Mrs. Westenra! Poor Lucy! Gone! Gone, never to return to us! And poor, poor Arthur, to have lost such a sweetness out of his life! God help us to bear all our troubles!" Dr. Seward's Diary Continued 
22 September. It is all over. Arthur has gone back to ring and has taken Quincy Morris with him. What a fine fellow is Quincy. I believe in my heart of hearts that he suffered as much about Lucy's death as any of us, but he bore himself through it like a moral viking. If America can go on breeding men like that, she will be a power in the world indeed. Van Helsing is lying down, having a rest preparatory to his journey. He goes to Amsterdam tonight, but says he returns tomorrow night, that he only wants to make some arrangements which can only be made personally. He is to stop with me, then, if he can. He says he has work to do in London, which may take him some time. Poor old fellow! I fear that the strain of the past week has broken down even his iron strength. All the time of the burial, he was, I could see, putting some terrible restraint on himself. When it was all over, we were standing beside Arthur, who, poor fellow, was speaking of his part in the operation, where his blood had been transfused to his Lucy's veins. I could see Van Helsing's face grow white and purple by turns. Arthur was saying that he felt since then as if they two had been really married, and that she was his wife in the sight of God. None of us said a word of the other operations, and none of us ever shall. Arthur and Quincy went away together to the station, and Van Helsing and I came on here. The moment we were alone in the carriage, he gave way to a regular fit of hysterics. He has denied to me since that it was hysterics, and insisted that it was only his sense of humor asserting itself under very terrible conditions. He laughed till he cried, and I had to draw down the blinds lest any one should see us and misjudge. And then he cried till he laughed again, and laughed and cried together just as a woman does. I tried to be stern with him, as one is to a woman under the circumstances, but it had no effect. Men and women are so different in manifestations of nervous strength or weakness. Then, when his face grew grave and stern again, I asked him why his mirth and why at such a time? His reply was in a way characteristic of him, for it was logical, and forceful, and mysterious. He said, Ah, you don't comprehend, friend John. Do not think that I am not sad, though I laugh. See, I have cried even when the laugh did choke me. But no more think that I am all sorry when I cry, for the laugh he come just the same. Keep it always with you, that laughter, who knock at your door, and say, May I come in? Is not true laughter. No, he is a king. And he come when and how he like. He ask no person. He choose no time of suitability. He say, I am here. Behold, an example, I grieve my heart out for that so sweet young girl. I give my blood for her, and though I am old and worn, I give my time, my skill, my sleep. I let my other sufferers want that she may have all. And yet I can laugh at her very grave, laugh, when the clay from the spade of the sexton drop from her coffin and say thud, thud to my heart till it send back the blood from my cheek. My heart bleed for that poor boy, that dear boy. So of the age of mine own boy had I been so blessed that he lived, and with his hair and eyes the same. There, you know now why I love him so, 
and yet when he say things that touch my husband heart to the quick and make my father heart yearn to him as to no other man not even you friend john for we are more level in experiences than father and son yet even at such a moment king laugh he come to me and shout and bellow in my ear here i am here i am till the blood come dance back and bring some of the sunshine that he carry with him to my cheek oh friend john it is a strange world a sad world a world of miseries and woes and troubles and yet when king laugh come he make them all dance to the tune he play bleeding hearts and dry bones of the churchyard and tears that burn as they fall all dance together to the music that he make with that smileless mouth of him. And believe me, friend John, that he is good to come, and kind. Ah, we men and women are like ropes, drawn tight with strain that pull us different ways. Then tears come, and like the rain on the ropes, they brace us up, till perhaps the strain become too great, and we break. But King Laugh, he come like the sunshine, and he ease off the strain again, and we bear to go on with our labor, what it may be. I did not like to wound him by pretending not to see his idea, but as I did not yet understand the cause of his laughter, I asked him. As he answered me, his face grew stern, and he said in quite a different tone, Oh, it was the grim irony of it all. This so lovely lady garlanded with flowers that looked so fair as life till one by one we wondered if she were truly dead. She laid in that so fine marble house, in that lonely churchyard, where rest so many of her kin, laid there with the mother who loved her, and whom she loved, and that sacred bell going toll, 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 so sad and slow, and those holy men with the white garments of the angel pretending to read books and yet all the time their eyes never on the page and all of us with a bowed head and all for what she is dead so is it not well for the life of me professor i said i can't see anything to laugh at in all that. Why, your expression makes it a harder puzzle than before. But even if the burial service was comic, what about poor Art and his trouble? Why, his heart was simply breaking. Just so. Said he not that the transfusion of his blood to her veins had made her truly his bride? Yes, and it was a sweet and comforting idea for him. Quite so. But there was a difficulty, friend John. If so that, then what about the others? Ho, oh, oh, ho, then this so sweet maid is a polyandrist, and me, with my poor wife dead to me, but alive by church's law, Though no wits, all gone, even I, who am faithful husband to this now no wife, am bigamist. I don't see where the joke comes in there either, I said, and I did not feel particularly pleased with him for saying such things. He laid his hand on my arm and said, Friend John, forgive me if I pay. 
I showed not my feelings to others when it would wound, but only to you, my old friend, whom I can trust. If you could have looked into my heart, then when I want to laugh, if you could have done so when the laugh arrived, if you could do so now, when King Laugh have pack up his crown, and all that is to him, for he go far, far away from me, and for a long, long time. And maybe you would perhaps pity me, the most of all. I was touched by the tenderness of his tone, and asked why. Because I know. And now we are all scattered, and for many a long day loneliness will sit over our roofs with brooding wings. Lucy lies in the tomb of her kin, a lordly death house in a lonely churchyard, away from teeming London, where the air is fresh and the sun rises over Hampstead Hill, and where wild flowers grow of their own accord. So, I can finish this diary, and God only knows if I shall ever begin another. If I do, or if I even open this again, it will be to deal with different people and different themes. For here at the end, where the romance of my life is told, here I go back to take up the thread of my life work. I say sadly, and without hope, Phineas. The Westminster Gazette, 25 September, The Hampstead Mystery. The neighborhood of Hampstead is just at present exercised with a series of events which seem to run on lines parallel to those of what was known to the writers of headlines as the Kensington Horror, or the Stabbing Woman, or the Woman in Black. During the past two or three days, several cases have occurred of young children straying from home, or neglecting to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children were too young to give any properly intelligible account of themselves, but the consensus of their excuses is that they had been with a bluefer lady. It has always been late in the evening when they have been missed, and on two occasions, the children have not been found until early in the following morning. It is generally supposed in the neighborhood that, as the first child missing gave as his reason for being away, that a bluefer lady had asked him to come for a walk. The others had picked up on the phrase and used it as occasion served. This is the more natural as the favorite game of the little ones at present is luring each other away by wiles. A correspondent writes us that to see some of the tiny tots pretending to be the bluefer lady is supremely funny. Some of our characterists might, he says, take a lesson in the irony of grotesque by comparing the reality and the picture. It is only in accordance with general principles of human nature that the bluefer lady should be the popular role at these alfresco performances. Our correspondent naively says that even Ellen Terry could not be so winningly attractive as some of these grubby-faced little children pretend, or even imagine themselves, to be. There is, however, possibly a serious side to the question, for some of the children, indeed all who have been missed at night, have been slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wound seems such as might be made by a rat or a small dog and although of not much importance individually, would tend to show that whatever animal inflicts them has a system or method of its own. The police of the division have been instructed to keep a sharp lookout for straying children, especially when very young, in and around Hampstead Heath, and for any stray dog which may be about. The Westminster Gazette, 25 September, extra special. The Hampstead Horror. Another child injured, the Bluefer Lady. We have just received intelligence that another child, missed last night, 
was only discovered late in the morning under a furze bush at the Shooter's Hill side of Hampstead Heath, which is perhaps less frequented than the other parts. It has the same tiny wound in the throat as has been noticed in other cases. It was terribly weak and looked quite emaciated. It too, when partially restored, had the common story to tell of being lured away by the Bluefer Lady. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Dracula. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter 14. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Robert Smith. M.B. Dennis Sayers. Mina Harker's Journal. 23rd September. Jonathan is better after a bad night. I am so glad that he has plenty of work to do, for that keeps his mind off the terrible things. And oh, I am rejoiced that he is not now weighed down with the responsibility of his new position. I knew he would be true to himself, and now how proud I am to see my Jonathan rising to the height of his advancement, and keeping pace in all ways with the duties that come upon him. He will be away all day till late, for he said he could not lunch at home. My household work is done, so I shall take his foreign journal, and lock myself up in my room and read it. 24th September. I hadn't the heart to write last night. That terrible record of Jonathan's upset me so. Poor dear! How he must have suffered, whether it be true or only imagination! I wonder if there is any truth in it at all. Did he get his brain fever, and then write all those terrible things? Or had he some cause for it all? I suppose I shall never know, for I dare not open the subject to him. And yet that man we saw yesterday! He seemed quite certain of him, poor fellow. I suppose it was the funeral upset him and sent his mind back on some train of thought. He believes it all himself. I remember how on our wedding day he said, Unless some solemn duty come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, mad or sane. There seems to be through it all some thread of continuity. That fearful Count was coming to London. If it should be, and he came to London, with its teeming millions, there may be a solemn duty, and if it come we must not shrink from it. I shall be prepared. I shall get my typewriter this very hour and begin transcribing. Then we shall be ready for other eyes if required. And if it be wanted, then perhaps, if I am ready, poor Jonathan may not be upset, for I can speak for him, and never let him be troubled or worried with it all. If ever Jonathan quite gets over the nervousness, he may want to tell me of it all, and I can ask him questions and find out things, and see how I may comfort him. Letter Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker 24 September Confidence Dear Madam, I pray you to pardon my writing, in that I am so far a friend as that I sent to you sad news of Miss Lucy Westernra's death. By the kindness of Lord Galdeming, I am empowered to read her letters and papers, for I am deeply concerned about certain matters vitally important. In them I find some letters from you, which show how great friends you were and how you love her. O oh, Madam Mina, by that love I implore you, help me. It is for others' good that I ask, to redress great wrong, and to lift much and terrible troubles that may be more great than you can know. May it be that I see you? You can trust me. I am friend of Dr. John Seward, and of Lord Galdeming, that was Arthur of Miss Lucy. I must keep it private for the present from all. I should come to Exeter to see you at once if you tell me I am privileged to come, and where and when. I implore your pardon, madam. I have read your letters to poor Lucy, and know how good you are and how your husband suffer. So I pray you, if it be, enlighten him not, lest it may harm. Again, your pardon and forgive me, Van Helsing. Telegram, Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing. 25th September. Come today by quarter past ten train if you can catch it. Can see you any time you call. Wilhelmina Harker. 
Mina Harker's Journal. 25th September. I cannot help feeling terribly excited as the time draws near for the visit of Dr. Van Helsing, for somehow I expect that it will throw some light upon Jonathan's sad experience, and as he attended poor dear Lucy in her last illness, he can tell me all about her. That is the reason of his coming. It is concerning Lucy and her sleep-walking, and not about Jonathan. Then I shall never know the real truth now. How silly I am! That awful journal gets hold of my imagination and tinges everything with something of its own colour. Of course it is about Lucy. That habit came back to the poor dear, and that awful night on the cliff must have made her ill. I had almost forgotten in my own affairs how ill she was afterwards. She must have told him of the sleep-walking adventure on the cliff, and that I knew all about it. And now he wants me to tell him what I know, so that he may understand. I hope I did right in not saying anything of it to Mrs. Westerner. I should never forgive myself if any act of mine, were it even a negative one, brought harm on poor dear Lucy. I hope, too, Dr. Van Helsing will not blame me. I have had so much trouble and anxiety of late that I feel I cannot bear more just at present. I suppose a cry does us all good at times, clears the air as other rain does. Perhaps it was reading the journal yesterday that upset me, and then Jonathan went away this morning to stay away from me a whole day and night, the first time we have been parted since our marriage. I do hope the dear fellow will take care of himself, and that nothing will occur to upset him. It is two o'clock, and the doctor will be here soon now. I shall say nothing of Jonathan's journal unless he asks me. I am so glad I have typewritten out my own journal, so that in case he asks about Lucy I can hand it to him. It will save much questioning. Later. He has come and gone. Oh, what a strange meeting! And how it all makes my head whirl round! I feel like one in a dream. Can it be all possible, or even a part of it? If I had not read Jonathan's journal first, I should never have accepted even such a possibility. Oh, poor, poor, dear Jonathan! How he must have suffered! Please the good God all this may not upset him again. I shall try to save him from it. But it may be even a consolation and a help to him, terrible though it be and awful in its consequences, to know for certain that his eyes and ears and brain did not deceive him, and that it is all true. It may be that it is the doubt which haunts him, that when the doubt is removed, no matter which, waking or dreaming may prove the truth, he will be more satisfied and better able to bear the shock. Dr. Van Helsing must be a good man as well as a clever one, if he is Arthur's friend, and Dr. Seward's and if they brought him all the way from Holland to look after Lucy. I feel from having seen him that he is good and kind, and of a noble nature. When he comes to-morrow I shall ask him about Jonathan. And then, please God, all this sorrow and anxiety may lead to a good end. I used to think I would like to practice interviewing. Jonathan's friend on the Exeter News told him that memory is everything in such work, that you must be able to put down exactly almost every word spoken, even if you had to refine some of it afterwards. Here was a rare interview. I shall try to record it verbatim. It was half-past two o'clock when the knock came. I took my courage a deux main and waited. In a few minutes Mary opened the door, and announced Dr. Van Helsing. I rose and bowed, and he came towards me, a man of medium weight, strongly built, with his shoulders set back over a broad, deep chest, and a neck well balanced on the trunk as the head is on the neck. The poise of the head strikes me at once as indicative of thought and power. The head is noble, well-sized, broad, and large behind the ears. The face, clean-shaven, shows a hard square chin, a large, resolute, mobile mouth, a good-sized nose, rather straight, but with quick, sensitive nostrils, that seem to broaden as the big, bushy brows come down and the mouth tightens. The forehead is broad and fine, rising at first almost straight, and then sloping back above two bumps or ridges wide apart, such a forehead that the reddish hair cannot possibly tumble over it, but falls naturally back and to the sides. Big, dark blue eyes are set widely apart, and are quick and tender or stern with the man's moods. He said to me, "'Mrs. Harker, is it not?' I bowed assent. "'That was Miss Mina Murray?' Again I assented. It is Miss Mina Murray that I came to see that was a friend of that poor dear child Lucy Westenra. Madame Mina, it is on account of the dead that I come. <coughs> Sir, said I, you could have no better claim on me than that you were a friend and helper of Lucy Westenra. And I held out my hand. 
He took it, and said tenderly, "'Oh, Madam Mina, I know that the friend of that poor little girl must be good, but I had yet to learn.' He finished his speech with a courtly bow. I asked him what it was that he wanted to see me about, so he at once began. "'I have read your letters to Miss Lucy. Forgive me, but I had to begin to inquire somewhere, and there was none to ask. I know that you were with her at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary. You need not look surprised, Madam Mina. It was begun after you had left, and was an imitation of you, and in that diary she traces by inference certain things to a sleep-walking in which she puts down that you saved her. In great perplexity, then, I come to you, and ask you, out of your so much kindness, to tell me all of it that you can remember." "'I can tell you, I think, Dr. Van Helsing, all about it.' "'Ah! Then you have good memory for facts, for details. It is not always so with young ladies.' "'No, Doctor. But I wrote it all down at the time. I can show it to you, if you like." "'Oh, Madam Mina, I will be grateful. You will do me much favour." I could not resist the temptation of mystifying him a bit. I suppose it is some taste of the original apple that remains still in our mouths, so I handed him the shorthand diary. He took it with a grateful bow, and said, "'May I read it?' "'If you wish,' I answered as demurely as I could. He opened it, and for an instant his face fell. Then he stood up and bowed. "'Oh, you so clever woman,' he said. "'I knew long that Mr. Jonathan was a man of much thankfulness, but see his wife have all the good things. And will you not so much honour me and so help me as to read it for me? Alas, I know not the shorthand." By this time my little joke was over, and I was almost ashamed. So I took the typewritten copy from my work-basket and handed it to him. "'Forgive me,' I said. I could not help it, but I had been thinking that it was of dear Lucy that you wished to ask, and so that you might not have time to wait, not on my account, but because I know your time must be precious, I have written it out on the typewriter for you." He took it, and his eyes glistened. "'You are so good,' he said. "'And may I read it now? I may want to ask you some things when I have read.' "'By all means,' I said. "'Read it over whilst I order lunch, and then you can ask me questions whilst we eat.' He bowed and settled himself in a chair with his back to the light, and became so absorbed in the papers, whilst I went to see after lunch chiefly in order that he might not be disturbed. When I came back, I found him walking hurriedly up and down the room, his face all ablaze with excitement. He rushed up to me and took me by both hands. "'Oh, Madam Mina,' he said, "'how can I say what I owe to you? This paper is as sunshine. It opens the gate to me. I am dazed, I am dazzled with so much light and yet clouds roll in behind the light every time. But that you do not, you cannot comprehend. Oh, but I am grateful to you, you so clever woman!" Madame, he said this very solemnly, if ever Abraham von Helsing can do anything for you or yours, I trust you will let me know. It will be pleasure and delight if I may serve you as a friend, as a friend. But all I have ever learned, all I can ever do, shall be for you and those you love. There are darknesses in life, and there are lights. You are one of the lights. You will live a happy life and a good life, and your husband will be blessed in you." But, Doctor, you praise me too much, and you do not know me." Not know you? I, who am old, and who have studied all my life, men and women? I, who have made my specialty the brain, and all that belongs to him, and all that follow from him? And I have read your diary that you have so goodly written for me, and which breathes out truth in every line. I, who have read your so sweet letter to poor Lucy of your marriage and your trust, not know you? Oh, Madam Nina! Good women tell all their lives, and by day and by hour and by minute such things that angels can read. And we men who wish to know have in us something of angels' eyes. Your husband is noble nature, and you are noble too, for you trust, and trust cannot be where there is mean nature. And your husband, tell me of him. Is he quite well? Is all that fever gone, and is he strong and hearty?" I saw here an opening to ask him about Jonathan, so I said, He was almost recovered but he has been greatly upset by Mr. Hawkins's death." He interrupted. "'Oh, yes, I know, I know. I have read your last two letters.' I went on. I suppose this upset him, for when we were in town on Thursday last, he had a sort of shock." "'A shock? And after brain fever so soon? That is not good. What kind of shock was it?' He thought he saw someone who recalled something terrible, something which led to his brain fever. And here the whole thing seemed to overwhelm me in a rush. The pity for Jonathan, the horror which he experienced, the whole fearful mystery of his diary, and the fear that has been brooding over me all since, all came in a tumult. I suppose I was hysterical, 
for I threw myself on my knees and held up my hands to him, and implored him to make my husband well again. He took my hands and raised me up and made me sit on the sofa, and sat by me. He held my hand in his, and said to me with, oh, such infinite sweetness, My life is a barren and lonely one, and so full of work that I have not had much time for friendships. But since I have been summoned to hear by my friend John Seward, I have known so many good people, and seen such nobility, that I feel more than ever, and it has grown with my advancing years, the loneliness of my life. Believe me, then, that I come here full of respect for you, and you have given me hope, hope, not in what I am seeking of, but that there are good women still left to make life happy, good women, whose lives and whose truths may make good lesson for the children that are to be. I am glad, glad that I may be here of some use to you. For if your husband suffer, he suffer within the range of my study and experience. I promise you that I will gladly do all for him that I can, all to make his life strong and manly, and your life a happy one. Now you must eat. You are overwrought and perhaps over-anxious. Husband Jonathan would not like to see you so pale, and what he like not where he love is not to his good. Therefore, for his sake, you must eat and smile. You have told me about Lucy, and so now you shall not speak of it, lest it distress. I shall stay in Exeter to-night, for I want to think much over what you have told me. And when I have thought, I will ask you questions, if I may. And then, too, you will tell me of husband Jonathan's trouble, so far as you can. But not yet. You must eat now. Afterwards, you shall tell me all. After lunch, when we went back to the drawing-room, he said to me, And now, tell me all about him. When it came to speaking to this great learned man, I began to fear that he would think me a weak fool, and Jonathan a madman. That journal is all so strange, and I hesitated to go on. But he was so sweet and kind, and he had promised to help, and I trusted him. So I said, Dr. Van Helsing, what I have to tell you is so queer that you must not laugh at me or at my husband. I have been since yesterday in a sort of fever of doubt. You must be kind to me, and not think me foolish that I have even half believed some very strange things. He reassured me by his manner as well as his words, when he said, "'Oh, my dear, if you only know how strange is the matter regarding which I am here, it is you who would laugh. I have learned not to think little of any one's belief, no matter how strange it may be. I have tried to keep an open mind, and it is not the ordinary things of life that could close it, but the strange things, the extraordinary things, the things that make one doubt if they be mad or sane. Oh, thank you! Thank you a thousand times. You have taken a weight off my mind. If you will let me, I shall give you a paper to read. It is long, but I have typewritten it out. It will tell you my trouble and Jonathan's. It is the copy of his journal when abroad, and all that happened. I dare not say anything of it. You will read for yourself and judge. And then when I see you, perhaps, you will be very kind and tell me what you think. I promise, he said as I gave him the papers. I shall in the morning, as soon as I can, come to see you and your husband, if I may. Jonathan will be here at half-past eleven, and you must come to lunch with us and see him then. You could catch the quick 334 train, which will leave you at Paddington before eight. He was surprised at my knowledge of the trains off-hand, but he does not know that I have made up all the trains to and from Exeter, so that I may help Jonathan in case he is in a hurry. So he took the papers with him and went away, and I sit here thinking, thinking, I don't know what. Letter by hand, Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker. 25 September, 6 o'clock. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. You may sleep without doubt. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. It may be worse for others, but for him and you there is no dread. He is a noble fellow, and let me tell you from experience of men, that one who would do as he did in going down that wall and into that room, I, and going a second time, is not one to be injured in permanence by shock. His brain and his heart are all right. This I swear, before I have even seen him. So be at rest. I shall have much to ask him of other things. I am blessed that today I come to see you, for I have learned all at once so much that again I am dazzled dazzled more than ever, and I must think. Yours, the most faithful, Abraham Van Helsing. Letter, Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing. 25th September, 6.30pm. My dear Dr. Van Helsing, a 
thousand thanks for your kind letter, which has taken a great weight off my mind. And yet if it be true, what terrible things there are in the world, and what an awful thing if that man, that monster, be really in London! Oh, I fear to think! I have this moment, whilst writing, had a wire from Jonathan, saying that he leaves by the 6.25 to-night from Launceston, and will be here at 10.18, so that I shall have no fear to-night. Will you, therefore, instead of lunching with us, please come to breakfast at eight o'clock, if this be not too early for you? You can get away if you are in a hurry by the 10.30 train, which will bring you to Paddington by 2.35. Do not answer this, as I shall take it that, if I do not hear, you will come to breakfast. Believe me, your faithful and grateful friend, Mina Harker. Jonathan Harker's Journal 26. September I thought never to write in this diary again, but the time has come. When I got home last night, Mina had supper ready, and when we had supped she told me of Van Helsing's visit, and of her having given him the two diaries copied out, and of how anxious she has been about me. She showed me in the doctor's letter that all I wrote down was true. It seems to have made a new man of me. It was the doubt as to the reality of the whole thing that knocked me over. I felt impotent and in the dark and distrustful, but now that I know I am not afraid even of the Count. He has succeeded, after all, then, in his design in getting to London, and it was he I saw. He has got younger, and how? Van Helsing is the man to unmask him and hunt him out, if he is anything like what Mina says. We sat late and talked it over. Mina is dressing, and I shall call at the hotel in a few minutes and bring him over. He was, I think, surprised to see me. When I came into the room where he was and introduced myself, he took me by the shoulder and turned my face round to the light and said, after a sharp scrutiny, But Madame Mina told me you were ill, that you had had a shock. It was so funny to hear my wife called Madame Mina by this kindly, strong-faced old man. I smiled and said, I was ill, I have had a shock, but you have cured me already. And how? By your letter to Mina last night, I was in doubt, and then everything took a hue of unreality, and I did not know what to trust, even the evidence of my own senses. Not knowing what to trust, I did not know what to do, and so had only to keep on working in what had hitherto been the groove of my life. The groove ceased to avail me, and I mistrusted myself. Doctor, you don't know what it is like to doubt everything, even yourself. No, you don't. You couldn't with eyebrows like yours. He seemed pleased and laughed as he said, So, you're a physiognomist. I learn more here with each hour. I am with so much pleasure coming to your breakfast. And, oh, sir, you will pardon praise from an old man, but you are blessed in your wife. I would listen to him go on praising Mina for a day, so I simply nodded and stood silent. She is one of God's women, fashioned by his own hand to show us men and other women that there is a heaven where we can enter, and that its light can be here on earth. So true, so sweet, so noble, so little an egoist, and that, let me tell you, is much in this age so skeptical and selfish. And you, sir, I have read all the letters to poor Miss Mina, and some of them speak of you, so I know you since some days, from the knowing of others. But I have seen your true self since last night. You will give me your hand, will you not? And let us be friends for all our lives. We shook hands, and he was so earnest and so kind that it made me quite choky. And now, he said, may I ask you for some more help? I have a great task to do and at the beginning it is to know. You can help me here. Can you tell me what went before your going to Transylvania? Later on I may ask more help, and of a different kind, but at first this will do. Look here, sir, I said. Does what you have to do concern the Count? It does, he said solemnly. Then I am with you, heart and soul. As you go by the 10.30 train, you will not have time to read them, but I shall get the bundle of papers. You can take them with you and read them in the train. After breakfast I saw him to the station. When we were parting he said, 
Perhaps you will come to town if I send for you, and take Madame Mina, too. We shall both come when you will, I said. I had got him the morning papers and the London papers of the previous night, and while we were talking at the carriage window, waiting for the train to start, he was turning them over. His eyes suddenly seemed to catch something in one of them, the Westminster Gazette. I knew it by the colour, and he grew quite white. He read something intently, groaning to himself. Mein Gott, mein Gott, so soon, so soon. I do not think he remembered me at the moment. Just then the whistle blew, and the train moved off. This recalled him to himself, and he leaned out of the window and waved his hand, calling out, Love to Madame Mina. I shall write so soon as ever I can. Dr. Seward's Diary 26 September Truly there is no such thing as finality. Not a week since I said finis, and yet here I am starting fresh again, or rather going on with the record. Until this afternoon I had no cause to think of what is done. Renfield had become, to all intents, as sane as he ever was. He was already well ahead with his fly business, and he had just started in the spider line also, so he had not been of any trouble to me. I had a letter from Arthur, written on Sunday, and from it I gather that he is bearing up wonderfully well. Quincy Morris is with him, and that is much of a help, for he himself is a bubbling well of good spirits. Quincy wrote me a line too, and from him I hear that Arthur is beginning to recover something of his old buoyancy. So as to them, all my mind is at rest. As for myself, I was settling down to my work with enthusiasm, which I used to have for it, so that I might fairly have said that the wound which poor Lucy left on me was becoming cicatrized. Everything is, however, now reopened, and what is to be the end, God only knows. I have an idea that Van Helsing thinks he knows, too, but he will only let out enough at a time to wet curiosity. He went to Exeter yesterday, and stayed there all night. Today he came back, and almost bounded into the room at about half-past five o'clock, and thrust last night's Westminster Gazette into my hand. What do you think of that? he asked as he stood back and folded his arms. I looked over the paper, for I really did not know what he meant, but he took it from me and pointed out a paragraph about children being decoyed away at Hampstead. It did not convey much to me until I reached a passage where it described small puncture wounds on their throats. An idea struck me, and I looked up. Well, he said, it is like poor Lucy's. And what do you make of it? Simply that there is some cause in common. Whatever it was that injured her has injured them. I did not quite understand his answer. That is true, indirectly, but not directly. How do you mean, Professor? I asked. I was a little inclined to take his seriousness lightly, for, after all, four days of rest and freedom from burning, harrowing anxiety does help to restore one's spirits. But when I saw his face, it sobered me. Never, even in the midst of our despair about poor Lucy, had he looked more stern. Tell me, I said. I can hazard no opinion. I do not know what to think, and I have no data on which to found a conjecture. Do you mean to tell me, friend John, that you have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of, not after all the hints given, not only by events, but by me, of nervous prostration following a great loss or waste of blood? And how was the blood lost or wasted? I shook my head. He stepped over and sat down beside me and went on. You 
are a clever man, friend John. You reason well, and your wit is bold, but you are too prejudiced. You do not let your eyes see, nor your ears hear, and that which is outside your daily life is not of account to you. Do you not think that there are things which you cannot understand, and yet which are? That some people see things that others cannot. But there are some things, old and new, which must not be contemplated by men's eyes, because they know, or think they know, some things which other men have told them. Ah, it is the fault of our science that it wants to explain all, and if it explain not, then it says there is nothing to explain. But yet we see around us every day the growth of new beliefs, which think themselves new, and which are yet but the old, would pretend to be young, like the fine ladies at the opera. I suppose now you do not believe in corporeal transference. No, nor in materialization. No, nor in astral bodies. No nor in the reading of thought. No, nor in hypnotism. Yes, I said, Charcot has proved that pretty well. He smiled as he went on. Then you are satisfied as to it, yes, and of course then you understand how it act, and can follow the mind of the great Charcot, alas that he is no more, into the very soul of the patient that he influenced. No? Then, friend John, am I to take it that you simply accept fact, and are satisfied to let, from premise to conclusion, be a blank? No? Then tell me, for I am a student of the brain, how you accept hypnotism, and reject the thought reading. Let me tell you, my friend, that there are things done today in electrical science which would have been deemed unholy by the very man who discovered electricity, who would themselves not so long before been burned as wizards. There are always mysteries in life. Why was it that Methuselah lived nine hundred years, and Old Parr one hundred and sixty-nine, and yet that poor Lucy with four men's blood in her poor veins, could not live even one day. For had she lived one more day, we could save her. Do you know all the mystery of life and death? Do you know the altogether of comparative anatomy, and can say wherefore the qualities of brutes are in some men, and not in others? Can you tell me why, when other spiders die small and soon, that one great spider lived for centuries in the tower of the old Spanish church, and grew and grew till, on descending, he could drink the oil of all the church lamps? Can you tell me why in the Pampas, I and elsewhere, there are bats that come out at night and open the veins of cattle and horses, and suck dry their veins. How in some islands of the western seas, there are bats which hang on the trees all day, and those who have seen them describe as like giant nuts or pods, and that when the sailors sleep on the deck, because that it is hot, flip down on them, and then and then, in the morning, are found dead men, white as even Miss Lucy was. Good God, Professor, I said, starting up, do you mean to tell me that Lucy was bitten by such a bat, and that such a thing is here in London, in the nineteenth century? He waved his hand for silence, and then went on. Can you tell me? why the tortoise lives more long than generations of men, why the elephant goes on and on till he have seized dynasties, and why the parrot never die only of bite of cat, of dog, or other complaint. 
Can you tell me why men believe in all ages and places that there are men and women who cannot die? We all know, because science has vouched for the fact, that there have been toads shut up in rocks for thousands of years, shut in one so small hole that only hold him since the youth of the world. Can you tell me how the Indian faker can make himself to die, and have been buried, and his grave sealed, and corn sowed on it, and the corn reaped, and be cut and sown, and reaped, and cut again, and then men come and take away the unbroken seal, and that there lie the Indian faker, not dead, but that rise up and walk amongst them as before here i interrupted him i was getting bewildered he so crowded on my mind his list of nature's eccentricities impossible impossibilities that my imagination was getting fired i had a dim idea that he was teaching me some lesson as long ago he used to in his study at amsterdam but he used them to tell me the thing, so that I could have the object of thought in mind all the time. But now I was without his help, yet I wanted to follow him. So I said, Professor, let me be your pet student again. Tell me the thesis, so that I may apply your knowledge as you go on. At present I am going in my mind from point to point, as a madman, and not a sane one follows an idea. I feel like a novice lumbering through a bog in a mist, jumping from one tussock to another in the mere blind effort to move on, without knowing where I am going. That is a good image, he said. Well, I shall tell you. My thesis is this. I want you to believe. To believe what? To believe in things that you cannot let me illustrate. I heard once of an American who so defined faith, that faculty which enables us to believe things which we know to be untrue. For one, I follow that man. He meant that we shall have an open mind, and not let a little bit of truth check the rush of the big truth, like a small rock does a railway. We shall get the small truth first. Good. We keep him, and we value him. But all the same, we must not let him think himself all the truth in the universe. Then you want me not to let some previous conviction inure the receptivity of my mind with regard to some strange matter. Do I read your lesson and write? Ah, you are my favorite pupil still. It is worth to teach you. Now that you are willing to understand, you have taken the first step to understand. You think then that those so small holes in the children's throats were made by the same that made the holes in Miss Lucy? I suppose so. He stood up and said solemnly, Then you are wrong. Oh, would it were so? But alas, no, it is worse, far worse. In God's name, Professor Van Helsing, what do you mean? I cried. He threw himself with a despairing gesture into a chair and placed his elbows on the table, covering his face with his hands as he spoke. They were made by Miss Lucy. End of chapter 14